Good evening, Cornerstone. Man, we're excited that you're with us today. Praise God. It's a good day to be in the kingdom of our God. How about you? Are you rejoicing in being part of this kingdom? It's a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm glad to be part of it. Hey, I want to read something to you out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 13. It says, Now, dear brothers and sisters. So again, we're talking to believers here. We want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Next verse says, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. The Bible says in another place, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's where we go. Amen. We tell you this, the next verse says, We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself... Come on now, listen, you're not going to find the word rapture in the Bible, but this is what we're looking for. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First the believers who will die will rise from their graves, then together with them we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air aren't you glad <laughs> listen then we will be with the lord forever so encourage each other with these words we're going to continue into verse uh, chapter 5 verse 2 it says for you know quite well that when the day of the lord's return will come it will be unexpectedly like a thief in the night listen if you knew uh, that your house was going to get broke into at 2 a.m you would be readily waiting for that thief and and do something about it right the bible says that the lord is going to come in the in the clouds in the sky he's going to come back like a thief in the night we don't know the day or the hour listen we can acknowledge the seasons that we live in clearly we are in the last days but i'm telling you do not let the lord's second coming catch you off guard like a thief in the night be ready don't be like you know the the parable of the ten virgins don't be like the five virgins who weren't ready when the master came let's be wise let's have our stuff ready to go Verse 6, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, so it says, So be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert, be clear-headed. It says that nighttime is time when, when people sleep and when drinkers drink. Hopefully that's, not you, you, hopefully that's not you tonight. But it says, Let us live, let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. And it says in the next verse that Jesus Christ died so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Isn't that the confident hope that we're believing for? Eternal salvation with Jesus Christ because we believed in him. Come on now. Let's skip down to verse 16. Because of these things, we have some encouragement from the word here in verse 16. 16 always be joyful you have a reason to rejoice today the next verse says never stop praying <laughs> surely you haven't run out of things to pray about <laughs> listen we need to be taking this time with the lord every day rejoicing in, in our salvation praying and spending quality time with our maker next verse says be thankful in all circumstances have you paused today just to give thanks for all the great things that are in your life have you paused and said man lord thank you for my wife thank you for my husband lord thank you for my children you ever just pause and just kind of looked around your house and say father thank you for this house thank you that i'm not living on the street thank you for the clothes on my back lord thank you that when i open my cupboards there's actually food in there <laughs> are, are you great sometimes it's real easy to overlook just the simple things it's kind of like when the power goes out. You don't understand how reliant on electricity you are until it's not there. Or when your internet goes down, how, how reliant on... used to be internet was just a thing for pleasure, but I'm telling you, you can't do anything in the world anymore without the internet. It's, it's almost like when the power goes down. Have you ever just paused and looked around and really just looked at your life and thought, boy, it could be a lot worse. Thank you, Lord, so much for what you've given me. Thank you, Lord, so much for salvation that you died to give me thankful in all circumstances for this is god's will for you who belong to jesus christ 
Come on now, he's describing believers. We should be joyful. We should never stop praying. We should be thankful in all circumstances. Next verse says, don't grieve the Holy Ghost. Don't stifle the Holy Ghost. Don't scoff at prophecy, but test everything that's said and hold on to what is good. This is describing some of the attributes of what a believer should look like. Stay away from every kind of evil. Is that you today? Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and make your whole spirit, soul, and body kept blameless until the Lord Jesus comes. You know, you know we're a three-part being. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of amazed a little bit. I've been asking some people recently this, this is a simple question here. What, if you are spirit, soul, and body, what part of you got saved when you got born again? And a lot of people can't answer that question. You need to understand you are three parts, right? Obviously, your physical body is interacting with this world around you. You have a soul. That's your mind, will, and emotions. It's kind of like an accessory. You know, you put on a belt, you put on a watch, <laughs> the kind of accessories to your outfit. Your mind, will, and emotions is kind of an accessory to your life, right? Your emotions are there to enhance your life, not govern your life. They're accessories. You are a spirit that lives inside of a body that has a soul. And so when you get born again, your spirit, man, gets reborn after the nature of Jesus Christ. And so now your spirit, man, wants to run after the kingdom of God and pursue all of these attributes of this new Christ-like person on the inside of you. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the day when Christ returns. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Brothers and sisters, greet one another with a holy kiss. Hey, that doesn't mean be walking around church smooching on each other now. Come on now. <laughs> Let's get these things straight in our heads of what it really means here. We're just talking about loving one another. Let the Holy Ghost who's inside of you, let the love of God flow out of your heart by the Holy Ghost who's put it in you today. Let's do all, everything that we can do to dwell in the kingdom, to abide in the secret place of the Most High so that we can find rest and peace and all of the prosperity and protection, all of the promises found in Psalms 91. Let's run after everything that Jesus Christ died to give us. Can we do that tonight? Listen, I got a video I'm going to show you real quick, and we're going to come back, and Jeff Gerald's is going to bring you a powerful word from the Bible. Be right back. Good evening, Cornerstone. It's Jeff, and uh, like Pastor Bill said, we're going to talk about something that's pretty, um, pretty, uh, pretty intense uh, for all practical purposes. Um, I don't know if uh, last Wednesday you guys heard when you know Pastor Bill was reading through Ephesians four, and it was just ringing my bell like constantly. And uh, and uh, when I did my last message, was talking about you know who do you say I am, and some of the things that Jesus said. And uh, we're going to be talking about one of the things that he said. And uh, did you know that Jesus said, before you want to be my disciple, you better first count the cost. And we're going to be talking about that today. And before we do, let's, let's, give, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Lord Jesus, we just, uh, again, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to do what we're doing. Um, Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day. And... Uh, we could go on and on with the wonderful things that you do, Lord, and the ways you bless us. 
But Lord, we ask you to prepare our hearts. I ask you, Lord, to empty me and just let, let your words flow out of my mouth. Lord, I just want to be a, a useful tool in your hands. Help us, Lord. Prepare our hearts and speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Luke 14, 28 says that if we want to be his disciple, we had better first count the cost. Don't begin until you count the cost. Now, this kind of flies in the face of, uh, of what American churches often tell a person they want to have saved. Most of the time, it goes like this. The pastor will come up and say, Jesus loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. And he'll give you peace, he'll give you joy, he'll give you everything you need, and uh, all you got to do is say this prayer. And that prayer generally goes like, uh, God, I know I'm a sinner, and just come into my heart and forgive me, and then that's it. You say amen, they slap you on the back and say, hey, welcome to the family of God, go on your way. But is that what Jesus told us to do? What did he tell us to do? Did he tell us to go and get a... Uh, 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 somebody to say a prayer and, and that's it? That's not what he said. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 tells us, go make disciples. He didn't say go say a prayer. He said go make disciples. And then verse 20 he says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. So he says, make disciples and teach them. He didn't say um, go get them to say a prayer. So this is pretty cut and dry to me. Um, but when Jesus went to make disciples, uh, you know, what did he say? Did he say, hi, my name's Jesus. I got a wonderful plan for your life. And if you just, you know, uh, say you believe in me, we're good. He didn't say that. No. Mark 1.15 says, he preached the gospel and said the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins. Matthew 14, uh, 4, 17 says, repent. I mean, Jesus says, repent, repent, repent. Luke 5, 32. I haven't come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 13, 3. He's talking to Pharisees. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus did not come saying, I got a wonderful plan for your life. I love you. No, he said, the kingdom of God is here. Repent. It's important. A lot of uh, American churches don't want to talk about that. It's a, it's a dirty word. No, oh, we're supposed to, you know, we're under grace. We don't, you know, have to worry about all that. No, Jesus says repent over and over. When he called the disciples, and by the way, he called more than just 12. You know, if you, if you read into like Luke 10, he called some 70, 72 other disciples. But what do you say? What do you say to him? He said, come, follow me. A disciple is a follower of a prophet or a teacher. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. Matthew 4.19, when he calls Peter and Andrew, what does he say? Come, follow me. We're going to keep going. Matthew 4.21, James and John, he said, come. He told them to come too. Matthew 16.24, Jesus says, anyone wants to be my follower. You must turn for your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Luke 5, 27. He calls Levi, the tax collector. He says, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, let's see. John 1, Talks to Philip. Says, Philip, come to me. Follow me. And one more. John 21, 19. Now, this is after Jesus had already risen from the death, and he's coming to Peter a second time. And this is after he's challenged Peter. Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he questions him three times. And he says, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. And then he says, come, follow me again to Peter. Are you getting the idea? Repentance, follow. Not just this quick, dirty prayer, quick and easy prayer. It's not, uh, a, a, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says that, you know, we're supposed to, sell the idea of an improved life. Um, Jesus didn't do that. He said, repent and follow me. Uh, but what we'll find out 
um, is that according to the world's per- point of view, it's, it's not like this improved wa- life of the way the world thinks of it. It would almost be like the opposite. <clears throat> but does Jesus love us? Of course he does. John 3.16, obviously, of course he loves us. For God so loved the world. Yes, he loves us. Does he have a wonderful plan for his life? Yes, he does. Absolutely. Jeremiah 29.11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Uh, does he give us peace and joy? Definitely. Of course he does. Romans 15.13. I mean, joy and peace because you trust in him. God will give those things to you. I mean, but, yes, he does do these things, but as a proper response to him by repenting, and following in his footsteps, living a life of obedience, just as Jesus did. These are blessings. Uh, these blessings are, are a benefit, a result of walking in the Spirit. The failure in presenting a gospel that sells Jesus as life, life improvement and, and fire insurance uh, is that disciples aren't being made here. It's like... Uh, it's like the seed that falls on stony ground that springs up right away and somebody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when the sun's out, the heat's on, they shrivel up. That's, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem here because there's, not, uh, there's no clear discipleship happening. There's no, uh, these churches just trying to get this quick decision just to get the number, you know? And, and that's the problem. Jesus did not tell us to get people saved. He told us, to make disciples. He said, teach my commands. Repent and follow, okay? Remember, we don't save anyone. That's Jesus' job. We point the way. You know, uh, we're the witnesses. We're the watchmen. We blow the trumpet. We sound the alarm. We explain to people and point them to the one who can save them. And if they have questions, we answer them. Uh, But these people are choosing Jesus for the promise of an improved life. And they do this without understanding why. They do this without understanding what a Christian even means. There's no repentance there. There's no new creation. There's no disciple being made. They take on Jesus in hopes that he'll make life comfortable for him. And uh, Pastor Bill, quite a long time ago, uh, did an illustration from Ray Comfort that was uh, about putting on a parachute. It's a good analogy. Uh, I'll give that to you again here. Um, Imagine you're on a flight, and the flight attendant says, put on this parachute. It'll improve your flight. So you say, hey, I'd like an improved flight. So you grab this parachute, and you you put it on, and it's immediately you notice it's kind of bulky, kind of heavy. You can't sit right in your seat anymore. You're kind of hanging off to the side a little bit. People are starting to look at you funny and tell you that you're kind of dumb. And then the... the, uh, (laughs) Then the, uh, the flight attendant comes with her little drink cart and bashes you in the elbow, and you're, you're, starting, to get, you're starting to get frustrated. And then you got the guys making fun of you, laughing on you, and you're not, you're not comfortable. Now your back's hurting, and you're just getting upset here. And finally, you're sick of it. You had enough, and you take this parachute off, and you throw it down, and you're like, this stupid parachute didn't improve my flight at all. But imagine, imagine this. Same, same flight. And the flight attendant comes up to you and says, hey, this plane's going to crash. Put on this parachute, and it's going to save your life. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. Some people might not accept it and might think you're you know, crazy, but just keep it on because you're going to have to jump. Well, guess what? It changes things. Now the parachute doesn't seem so awkward, so heavy. It doesn't really bother you that you're kind of sitting crooked in your seat. You know, you're anticipating the jump doesn't really matter if the flight attendant comes and bashes your elbow with the drink cart. That's just a minor inconvenience. In fact, it might actually make you clutch onto your parachute even more. (laughs) You know? As for the people who are making fun of you, calling you names, well, with what you know, you now feel sorry for them. You feel sorry for the ones who don't have it. You feel sorry for the ones that you're pleading with, hey, we're going down, you need to take a parachute. And they're like, pfft. No, we're good. We're good. Just some turbulence. You feel sorry for him. What's the difference? The difference is, in the second story, the flight attendant informed the passenger of what's ahead, why they needed the parachute. And then that passenger was able to consider the cost of putting the parachute on and 
not being comfortable a little bit. He's able to count the cost between having the parachute and the, what's going to happen if you don't. There's a choice that was being able to made there. It's the same concept of Jesus as accepting Jesus as our Lord. So many converts will fall away uh, because they never counted the cost of what being a disciple or being a follower of Jesus is. They have no real reason other than wanting this improved life. They have no idea that their sins have separated them from God, according to Isaiah 59, too. It is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's turned away and will not listen anymore. They don't understand that because nobody's telling them. They have no idea that, according to John 3.36, that the wrath of God's judgment abides on them. If we don't count the cost and get a good understanding of this ourselves, and this, you guys, is, is, this, is this is for me. I, I, this is, is uh, very important to me. Um, you know, this whole message is for me, really, uh, honestly, because uh, I want to be a good disciple. <laughs> I want to do it right this time. Um, but if we don't get a good understanding of what that means and the fact that there is a cost to it, we're going to end up failing in our assignment of making disciples because we won't be a good disciple ourselves. So, what are some things that Jesus says about this? We're going to look at Luke 14, 26 to 28, and verse 33. But number one, what kind of cost is there? Love Jesus above everything else. Love him above all. Luke 14, 26, it says, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everybody else by comparison to your love for me. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers, sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. See, Jesus saved and redeemed us from the curse of sin and the wrath of God. He expects our complete, 100% commitment, love, and loyalty to the extent that comparatively our love for him would look like hatred. Next to anybody else, I mean, next to our own families, it would look like hatred. He says the same thing about our lives. Our hopes, dreams, desires, our careers, hated. Not important. Jesus is all that's important. We have to love him above everything else. If we love or obey anything or anyone more than Jesus, then we are not fit to be his disciple. That's not my words. That's what he says. And since he's God, he makes the rules. Matthew 10, 37, Jesus actually says, if we love anyone more than him, we're not worthy of being his. Pretty stiff words, but again, Jesus is God Almighty, and he makes the rules, and he is a jealous God, and he's not going to share our love with anybody else. Not your wife, not your kids, not your husband, not your job, not your dog, not your boss. Nobody. Okay, number two, carry your own cross and follow him. Luke 14, 27 says, If you do not carry your own cross, and there it is, follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus expects us to pick up our own cross, deny our own ambitions, our own goals, and follow his direction, his purpose. Now, remember, when Jesus was here on earth, he said, I didn't do anything or say anything of myself. I did what God the Father told me. I said what God the Father told me to say. That's no different than what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be doing what Jesus tells us, saying what he says, acting the way he act. We've got to deny our own ambitions. He gave us all and carried his cross to redeem us. He expects us to pick up our cross and live for him. Number three, consider the cost before committing. Verse 28 says, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Uh, he gives a clear wording here to me, um, the way I think, uh, don't start until you've counted the cost. Don't start until you understand what you're doing, what you're in for. 
Don't start unless you're all in. Don't start unless you're going to be doing this all the way. Don't do it part way. We know what that means. That's a lukewarm Christian. He doesn't want nothing to do with that. He wants you all the way. Number four, surrender everything. Luke 14, 33 says, you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. Does that mean we're supposed to go sell everything we have? If that's what he wants. But does that mean that's what we're supposed to do? You know what? Pastor Matt and I were talking the other night, and he, he, he made a, an amazing, of course, profound thing, profound statement that just sticks with me. He says, you know, we have these altar calls, and most of the time people are coming up trying to get something from God. He goes, but what a lot of people forget is that is an altar. They call it an altar call. What are we giving to him? What are we putting on the altar? What do we have that's more important than him? You know, I don't think it's, uh, of course, it, it was no, you know, accident that when God said, Abraham, take your son, your one and only son, and give him to me. You know? And then he says, stop, I see that you, you know, that you fear God above all. I mean, this is what God's after. He doesn't want anything standing in the way of him and you. Nothing standing in the way. We got to be willing to put it all on the line, all or nothing. Like Job, I'll trust him with my life. We got to be that way. Jesus demands all we have, all we are. Paul in Romans 12, 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, I plead to you, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is a truly the way to worship him. New King James says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. There's a reasonable expectation and cost to being a follower of Jesus Christ. There really is. Evangelist Billy Graham said this, salvation's free. But discipleship costs everything we have. It's a true statement. Salvation is a gift from God. It's a gift for us. It is free to us, but it will cost us everything to be a disciple. You know, I, I don't, in my, in my mind, I don't see a distinction between the two. I don't think you can be truly saved to the Lord without being a disciple. <laughs> to me, the two things are the same, really. Evangelist Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. That's a true statement. He does. And we've got to be willing to either die to ourselves, die to our jobs, die to our money, die to our relationships. Yeah, I mean, the, the, everything is on the altar when it comes to what Jesus expects. Got to have it all out there. It's all his anyways. So what dies, though? Our old nature does. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old life is gone and new life's begun. Praise God. Thank you, God. Galatians 5.24 and 25 says, though he, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Amen. There are some things that get put on that cross that we are to bear. Our passions, our desires, the old life, the old way, the old living. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is Paul. I mean, Paul taking it as far as saying... I'm not any more alive. I'm, I'm dead. It's just Christ in me. There's nothing left. It's just Christ in me. Wow. That's what I want. I want to get there. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. But we're crucified with Christ. Anyone that truly encounters the Lord Jesus, repents and confesses him as Lord, cannot help but be changed. 
You cannot have a true life encounter with Jesus Christ, have a repentant heart, and not come away being any different. You can't. He gives us a new nature. Read Romans 6. It talks about how our old sinful nature has been crucified with Christ. We're now alive in him and no longer a slave to sin. There is a cost to following Jesus. He demands your passion, your possession, your power, your position, your purpose, and everything you hold precious. It's his. Once you're the Lord, you have given him dominion over your mind, body, and soul. You no longer can do what you want, say what you want, act like you want, think like you want, live like you want. We are children of the Most High God, and he dis demands that we conduct ourselves accordingly. Number five, you belong to God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. Verse 20 says, For God bought you with a high price, so you honor God with your body. In any application that you can think of, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19 says, For you know God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. That you might say, oh, you know, okay, Jeff, you know, Romans six fourteen says, I'm under grace. You know, 2 Corinthians three seventeen says, where the Lord is, there's freedom. All things are lawful for me according to, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, so I can live however I want because I'm free and I'm under grace and all things are lawful for me. I love it when people try these arguments because most of the time it's from a person who just wants their get out of hell free card. And they want to play games with God. They just want the, you know, fire insurance. And I don't want the rest. I always say, read the rest of those scriptures. Because 99% of the time, they're misquoting them anyways. But I always go to these. Number six, you're free from sin. You're not free to sin. Galatians 5.13 says, you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't. Use your freedom to satisfy your own sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Okay? Yeah, we have freedom. Yes, we're under grace. But that does not give us a license to sin. That is nowhere in Scripture. It's a, in fact, the, the verses I'm going to give you are the exact opposite. So if you're thinking that way, you're wrong. And we need to change that. Because I did, and I still am. Uh, like I said, this message is for me, and there's a lot of application to this just for me. So Romans 6.22. Now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. We are slaves to God. Why? Because he purchased us. We are not our own anymore. I don't own this body no more. God does. 1 Peter 2.16, you are free, yet you are God's slave, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. So no, you can't do whatever you want. <laughs> Romans 6, 1-2, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Again, application as far as you can think. First Peter 1 Peter 1.14-16 So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. Very clear here. There's no, uh, there's no wiggle room. 
like uh, like Pastor Bill said last Wednesday, you know, when he was reading Ephesians 4, we don't skirt up to the line to see how close we can get away with it. Don't play with the line. You know, it's almost like we are like little kids trying to see how much we can get away with. That's not the point. The point is, be holy, for he's holy. The point is, we don't own this no more. We do what he says. Like, how can, uh, there's that verse in the Proverbs, how can a man, you know, clasp fire to his belly and not be burned? Don't play. Don't play with it. Don't play around with it. Don't, don't tap dance with it. Stay away from it. All right, how about avoiding the appearance of evil? Okay, let's make sure our actions don't cause another to stumble. You know, uh, that's that uh, not all, thing, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful to others. We'll get into some of that. Christians should avoid doing things, even if they aren't wrong in and of themselves, if doing so might make a brother stumble, like 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, okay? Be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. Okay, where does this, where's the application in this? Okay, there's, there's the, uh, well, it depends. I mean, there's, you could go a lot of different ways with this. <laughs> there's, uh, let's see, there's people that would talk about, you know, which day is uh, supposed to be the Sabbath. There's those that would argue that it's Saturday. There's those that would argue that it's Sundays. There's those that would say, you know what, it doesn't matter, just pick a day and worship him on that day, whatever it falls for you, whatever, you know, there's people that would fight tooth and nail over that, you know, and do we argue with them? Do we fight with them? Or do we say, you know, <laughs> there's those possibilities. There's like, uh, like, like Jewish people in, uh, in ham, you know, it's like, uh, like when Paul had his freedom, you know, he'd hide his ham sandwich behind his back if he was going to, you know, the temple to talk to some Sadducees, you know. <laughs> he didn't want to offend them, you know, but he was free to eat a ham sandwich, I suppose, you know. So Christians, let's move on here. Okay, Christians must ensure that they live honorably in the sight of all men. Second Corinthians 8.21. <laughs> so if I eat something that causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. <laughs> Ironically, this is Paul. That's funny. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. It's important that we watch what we do. It's important. Let's not cause somebody to stumble. If they're like, you know, if they like, well, you know, I, I, I think that wearing skirts is wrong. If that's their thing, that's their thing. Let them deal with it, you know, whatever. But let's not make them stumble. That's, that's what we got to watch for. Try not to make a brother stumble. Okay, let's, moving along. Have you counted the cost? We need to count the cost. We gotta think about these things. The Lord calls us to holiness and godliness. He calls us, like 2 Corinthians six seventeen. come out, be separate. We can't walk like the world and walk with Jesus Christ at the same time. We can't. You know why? They're going two different directions. We can't hold God's hand and hold the world's hand. Can't do it. You'll either love one, hate the other, cling to one, and despise the other. That's in the Word. We can't do both. You can't live like the devil Monday through Saturday, wash your face, and praise the Lord to heaven on Sunday. Can't do it. I know because I've tried. It don't work. <laughs> it don't work. Because your works will declare. Your works will declare everything, really. I've tried it. It don't work. You can't. Look like the world, act like the world, sound like the world, and waltz in the throne room of our mighty God because he'll, he'll, he'll see right through that. He's, he's not, you're not tricking nobody. You might trick this eye, but you ain't tricking the one that matters. Okay, have you counted the cost? There was only one answer, complete, total surrender. Turn away from the sinful nature. Cling with all you are to Jesus Christ, who by himself took all of our sin to his own body willingly bore the wrath of a holy and just God, paying your penalty, taking your place. Repent, follow. That's what he says. It's not your best life now. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, I'll give you a wonderful life. I'll give you everything you want. It ain't that. It's repent. It's follow. It's do what I did. 
That's what he says. It's pretty clear. Repent and follow, slide number seven. That's what it is. Acts 3.19. Look at this. You want some improvement. Repent of your sins, turn to God, so that your sins will be wiped away. I think the next verse says, and you'll receive times of refreshing, if I remember that. Can you put that 320 up there real quick? Did I put it up there? I probably didn't. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. How about that? You want some refreshment? You want some improvement? Repent, turn to God, and then he'll refresh you. There you go. Proverbs 28, 13. What do we say? Repent, right? People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from their sins, they will receive mercy. Repentance. That's what turning away is. Hebrews 12, 14. These are some things... Uh, you work at living peace with all and work at living a holy life. For those who are holy will not, not holy will not see the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.17, this is the things that we're supposed to be doing. This is what we can be doing. We walk by faith, not by sight. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee immorality. Biggest sin in America right now, I think. <laughs> Rampant, immorality. Not just the physical acts, the visual acts, the thought life. You know, these are things that we need to be fleeing from and being aware of. Let's keep going. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Pastor Bill just went through this, but this is stuff that we should be doing. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Amen. You didn't take a look at my notes, did you? Yes. All right, good. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Something is important. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Can't, can't stress this enough. We got to be in God's word daily, regularly. Not just on Sundays and Wednesdays. Wipe the dust off your Bible, blow the dust off, open it up, flip some pages, read it. That's what we need to be doing because the Word of God will change you. Changes me, I know that. Let's keep moving here. 2 Corinthians 3.15, or 3.5, I'm sorry. Is your hope in a prayer? Is that what your hope's in? You know, when somebody asks you, are you saved, or do you know Jesus? And you say, well, yeah, you know, uh, my mom and dad are, and, you know, they go to church, and I go to the same church that they do, and, uh, yeah, I'm saved. You sure? What's your hope in? How about if you say, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I went to that, I went to that one youth meeting that one time, and, and I said that prayer. I said the prayer. I, I said what the guy said. I meant it. All 15 times I did it. Examine yourself to see if your faith's genuine, as New King James says, to see if you're in the faith. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you've failed the test of genuine faith. Examine yourself. Get in the Word. You know what? I'm going to tell you something personal. I had to do this. Uh, pretty much uh, right before, well, actually, maybe a little bit after. Yeah, it was actually after, after we started coming here. I remember standing outside of our garage and talking to my wife and saying, you know what? I don't know if I'm his. And what did I do? <laughs> I got in my word, and I read, and I read, and I read, and I remember my wife wrote down verses for me, and she stuck them on the, on the window on my, uh, in our bathroom for me. She wrote them out, these verses, and stuck them on the window there so I could look at them in the mirror when I was brushing my teeth. Reminders, getting the word in me, because the word will tell me. The word getting in me is what I needed. Examine yourself. How do you do that? Open the word of God. It's a mirror. It'll show you what you are. Did me. Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit. 
then you won't be doing what your sinful nature wants to. Let's walk in the Spirit. We won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? In closing, we clearly understand that there is a cost for being a disciple of Jesus. And you know, in all honesty, I only spoke in some generalities tonight. I didn't really get down deep into it. I didn't talk about, you know, persecution. I didn't talk about being hated for Jesus' name. I didn't talk about jail time. I didn't talk about martyrdom. martyrdom. You know, but you can say, Jeff, come on, it's America. That stuff don't happen around here. You guys remember the Columbine shooting? 1990? It was 20 years ago. You know, the two girls that were killed there, Cassie Bernal and Rachel Scott, they were both professed Jesus Christ before they were killed. They asked, they were asked, are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a Christian? They said yes. Boom, they were shot. Oh, it happens. That was 20 years ago. You think we're getting better or worse? You know, with all the lies that are on, you know, on the news and all the stuff you can't believe anymore, how much of it's not getting, how much of it isn't making it, making it there, you know? That was 20 years ago. You know, look around. It's not always going to come out bold and ugly like that. A lot of times stuff will come out subtle, a little trickery. Like, uh, it's for your safety, it's for your protection. I don't know if you know this, but uh, recently the Illinois governor just banned church services for people over 50. This is the wording that he used. Until a vaccine is widely available, or until another effective treatment is found and widely available, or until the state of Illinois sees no new COVID-19 cases over a significant period of time. Wow. Wow. Where's the vaccine? Questions. What's widely available mean? Widely available to who? Everybody or to the county or to the state? What's widely available? What's a significant (laughs) period of time? How long is that? You see, churches over 50. Nope, can't meet. Hmm, interesting. Are you getting the picture here? Have you counted the cost? Are we ready to stand for Christ? Are we willing to suffer any amount, even die for the cause of Christ? Do you realize that 11 of the 12 disciples were murdered for believing in Jesus? The other 70 that are talked about, they're scattered. They left him. Did you count the cost? Only John died of old age. That was after he was burned in oil by Nero. Then he was exiled to an island. How far are we willing to go? How much are we putting on the altar? What are we going to put on the altar? Evangelist Paul Washer, look at this picture up here. Evangelist Paul Washer said at a 2002 youth conference, if following Jesus doesn't cost you anything, it's because you've bought into American Christianity. But I want to end this tonight by reading to you a message that Paul spoke to the elders of the church of Ephesus before he was killed for the gospel. It's in uh, Acts 20. So grab your Bibles real quick. I'm going to grab mine. Acts 20, 19 through 36, it is a beautiful example of a life that was dedicated to the service of the Lord, loving the family of God, and willingly accepting the cost of being a disciple for Jesus. All right, verse 19, where are we at here? Go ahead and put that up there. Ready? Ready? I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. Now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me that in city after city, jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news of the wonderful grace of God. Verse 25. And now I know that none of you who I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it is not my fault, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Verse 28, so guard yourself 
and God's people, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over the, which the Holy Spirit has appointed you leaders. I know false teachers like vicious wolves will come among you, even after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some of the men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. But watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant care and watch over you, night and day, and my many tears for you. Now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all of those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and the needs of those who were with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried and embraced and kissed him goodbye. Now, he heads off, and then he's uh, with a guy named... Agabus, and this is just in chapter 21, but look at what he says in verse 13. 21 verse 13. He said, Why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but to even die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Think of Paul's life. This is a man that's been shipwrecked, beaten multiple times. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament while he was in jail. He counted the cost. And look what he said. My life is worth nothing, but I just want to preach the gospel. Do we count the cost, church? Do we count the cost? Because we need to. Let's pray. Father God, we give thee glory. We give you glory, Lord. We thank you for your word. Help us, Lord to lay our all on the altar for you. Let us be true disciples, Lord. Let us hear you clearly. Let us do things without fear. Let us walk boldly in faith. Let us worship you with open hands, Lord. Help us to run full ahead, full steam ahead for you, Lord. We ask that you bless the rest of our day. We give you honor, glory, and all the praise because you deserve all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.